Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how molecular dipoles can arise from the resonance structures associated with a molecule. Specifically, we're going to be looking at how donor heteroatoms like oxygen and nitrogen can lead to charged resonance structures and unique molecular dipoles. Let's go ahead and get started. So, one of the most important things that we need to understand is how resonance structures with partial charges can arise. Well, when we have a heteroatom that's adjacent to a pi system, that is a double bonded system, the lone pair or a double bond from the heteroatom can interact with that pi system, giving either a resonance donation in the case of a lone pair or a resonance withdrawal in case of a double bond to a heteroatom. Let's go ahead and look at an example. So let's say we have this molecule here, which has the heteroatom oxygen, which has some nice lone pairs adjacent to a pi system, the double bond between the two carbons. That lone pair can go ahead and delocalize into the pi system. We can represent this as a set of electron pushing arrows in red, where the lone pair pushes down into that bond and kicks the double bond as a lone pair onto the carbon. That in turn gives the following resonance structure, where the oxygen now carries a partial positive charge and the carbon carries a partial negative charge. This is going to be significant for later. Another possibility is that we have a double bonded heteroatom like this carbonyl group adjacent to a pi system. In this case, the uh, double bonded heteroatom can act as a withdrawing group and the double bond from this pi system can push here and then this bond will push onto the heteroatom because it is withdrawing the electron density towards itself. And that will provide the following resonance structure. Here, in this case, now you can see how the electrons have moved as a negative charge onto the oxygen, and the carbon has been left electron deficient with a partial positive charge. So, now let's return to our original molecule here with no resonance structures, and consider what does the molecular dipole look like? Well, if we look at it from the perspective of electronegativity or induction, we would expect the dipoles to point in this direction. Why is that the case? Well, oxygen is significantly more electronegative than carbon, and we know that electronegative atoms withdraw electron density towards themselves through an inductive method, through the sigma bonds between the atoms, and that leads to dipoles which point towards the negative atom. Right? So we would expect each bond to point in that direction, and due to the vector summation of bond dipoles, we would expect the overall molecular dipole to look something like that in terms of the geometry. It would point straight up through the oxygen. But we also know that this molecule has a resonance structure, which has a oxygen with a partial positive charge and a carbon with a partial negative charge. Formal charges are also associated with dipole moments since they are quite literally charges on the atoms. And in this case, the dipole would point from the positive oxygen to the negative carbon. These are quite different, right? So which one of these is giving the accurate depiction of the molecular dipole, right? Which one is it? Well, generally, we consider that resonance effects are more significant than inductive effects. So generally speaking, we will consider that the right molecule will probably be a more significant contributor to the overall molecular dipole. However, that is certainly not always the case. There are plenty of exceptions where the inductive effect might be particularly strong for a molecule and will trump the resonance effect. However, oftentimes resonance does tend to win out in the overall molecular superposition. So let's go ahead and look at some examples to really understand how this molecular dipole effect is arising from resonance. So the first molecule we want to look at is aniline, which has this nice nitrogen heteroatom with a lone pair adjacent to a large conjugated pi system, the benzene ring. So I'm going to go ahead and throw up all of the possible resonance structures, and then we'll work through them with the electron pushing arrows. So all of these are valid resonance structures for aniline, and the way they form is, well, let's start off by taking this lone pair and moving it into this double bond, or moving it into a double bond, and this result is that this double bond gets kicked up onto the carbon as a negative charge. That carbon, now having a negative charge in the form of a lone pair, will then move its own electron density as follows, to give this resonance structure with the negative charge on that carbon. And then one more, the lone pair pushes again onto this carbon. And so we've effectively delocalized the lone pair between the nitrogen and the, these three carbons at the ortho and para positions relative to the nitrogen. Why is this significant? 
Well, I'm going to go ahead and erase this for a second. But you'll notice that the nitrogen now in most of these resonance structures is carrying a positive charge, which means that on the overall molecule, so if I go ahead and erase this, on the overall molecule, the nitrogen is going to carry a partial positive charge, whereas these carbons here on the ortho and the para positions are going to carry partial negatives. What does that mean? Well, we know that molecular dipoles point from positive to negative, and so we would actually expect the dipole moment of aniline to point from the nitrogen to the carbons, with nitrogen being the positive, which is the exact opposite of what you would expect from resonant, from uh, inductive effects. I apologize, from inductive effects, because nitrogen is more electronegative and it should withdraw inductively. But we know that resonance typically dominates, and so the dipole moment actually looks like this. Another molecule which is interesting is pyridine. So pyridine has a nitrogen in an aromatic ring, and we also see that it has a lone pair here. However, this is a tricky situation because this lone pair actually cannot delocalize into the aromatic ring. Why is that? It looks pretty similar to the other case. Well, the pyridine lone pair is actually in a sp2 orbital which is orthogonal or perpendicular to the rest of the pi system because it's already double bonded. So that lone pair on an already double bonded atom is going to be perpendicular to the pi system and won't interact with it. It will not delocalize into the rest of the pi system. As a result, there is no resonance structure associated with that lone pair for pyridine, and so the only effect we get from the nitrogen is an inductively withdrawing effect. The nitrogen is just going to pull electron density towards itself. As a result, the molecular dipole for pyridine looks like this, the opposite of that for aniline. We're pointing towards the nitrogen, because here we only have an inductive effect, no resonance effects. Let's go ahead and look at one more thing here, which is going to be the ozone molecule. Right? And this is an interesting example, because typically when we think of homonuclear molecules, molecules made of only one atom, we see that they have no dipole moment. They're completely nonpolar, because an electronegativity difference of zero should lead to no net pulling of the electron density, right? O2, N2, F2, any of the diatomic halogens, they're all going to be completely nonpolar. And yet, when we look at O3, it ends up having a dipole moment of 0.53 divide which is appreciably polar. It's not you know, super high, but it's certainly not zero. Why is that the case? Well, if we go ahead and look at the molecular structure for ozone, we'll see that the atoms actually carry positive and negative formal charges. In fact, right, we see that ozone has two resonance structures, one where the oxygen on the right carries the negative and one where the oxygen on the left carries the negative. In either case, though, the central oxygen is going to carry a positive formal charge. So because the, resonant, the overall molecule is a superposition of these two resonance structures, we would expect that the oxygens on the tops, or the left and the right rather, are going to carry partial negative charges in the real molecule. And the oxygen in the bottom is going to carry a partial positive charge, even though electronegativity wise, they are all equal, right? So the overall molecular dipole is going to end up pointing in this direction because of the resonance structures, because of these formal charges on the oxygen atoms. Last but certainly not least, I want to go ahead and look at the interesting case of toluene. Toluene, which looks as follows, also known as methylbenzene, is a pure hydrocarbon. It only consists of C and H. As a result, you would probably expect that toluene is nonpolar. It doesn't have any polar bonds associated with it. However, toluene does in fact have a molecular dipole of about 0.375 Debye which is rather strange, right? This doesn't make sense from an inductive perspective, and even from a standard resonance delocalization perspective, it doesn't really make sense either because carbon doesn't have any lone pairs or double bonds here to uh, you know, contribute any sort of withdrawing or donation effect. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that there is a resonance structure associated with toluene, and it's the following one. There's actually a resonance structure in which one of the methyl group hydrogens comes off as a proton and as a result, the, a double bond is moved from the benzene ring to the methyl group, which delocalizes a negative charge density into this carbon, and also at the para and the other ortho positions. So all three of the, those positions end up having a partial negative charge. How does this resonance structure happen, though? This certainly isn't like anything we look at typically. Well, this is a unique case of what is known as hyperconjugation, which is resonance through single bonds rather than double bonds. And in organic chemistry too, you'll explore this effect a little bit more. 
But the way this works is essentially if you were to look at the orbitals for the benzene ring, the, the p orbitals, which are contributing to the pi bonds, and the sigma bond between the methyl group and its hydrogen, you'll see that they're actually rather symmetrical. They're in the same uh, orientation. They're parallel to one another. Because they're parallel to one another, just like those p orbitals can interact through a sideways overlap, this p orbital here and this sigma bond, or rather the orbital from the carbon that is bonded to the hydrogen can interact in a sideways overlap, right? So we now are going to form a bond between these two orbitals here and a sideways pi type overlap, which is what gives us that structure right there, right? So we have this sideways overlap between the sigma bonding orbital of the methyl group and the pi, and the p orbital of the benzene ring, which gives us this hyperconjugated resonance structure, in which case we have a, a proton sort of dissociating from the ring, which is going to give it a partial positive charge there at this end of the molecule. So, right, so as a result of that dissociation, we're going to carry a partial positive, and the benzene ring now is going to take a partial negative charge, since the uh, ortho and para positions are going to carry formal negatives. As a result, the molecular dipole for toluene is going to look as follows. It's going to point towards the left-hand side there, right? And this is where the dipole moment arises from, from this unique circumstance of hyperconjugation. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist. And if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.